Okay, uh, I'm Philip Roberts, Extension Entomologist located here in Tifton, and we'll take the last 15 minutes and I want to talk to you a little bit about BT cottons and, and corn earworm. Uh, first thing before I forget, I do have pesticide credit forms up here. I'll tell you, I forgot to submit this until the first of last week, so I don't know how many hours, but historically for this meeting, we'll get one hour of credit for the weeds, the plant path, and the insect session. So fill those out. We've also got a publication up here on thrips management. It's a summary of work that myself, Dr. Taves, and entomologists across the southeast. So it's a pretty good read, and uh, about as much as you want to know about thrips and management in cotton. And we also have a little book up here on pollinators. And uh, this is uh, kind of a a guide with some suggestions and thoughts on how we can be better stewards in terms of protecting pollinators across our landscape. Okay, I've shown this slide for years, and again, it's such a great story, but a lot of us weren't producing cotton back in the 1980s prior to having boll weevils. But during that time, average number of sprays may have been in excess of 15. Uh, interestingly, as I go around to counties doing meetings, a lot of times I'll ask people to raise their hand if they've seen a bow weevil. And Dr. Crawford, those are fewer and fewer people. But once we got bow weevil free, that reduced our insecticide inputs down to about five. And there's a period of about four or five years there once we were bow weevil free and we did not have BT cotton. And on average, when we were targeting primarily corn earworm and tobacco budworm, we would spray cotton about five times. That's when we really, my predecessor, Dr. Bill Lambert, he really focused a lot about beneficial insects, conserving beneficial insects. And we know that program works. But then in 1996, that's when BT cotton was commercialized and interestingly, Dr. Crawford, I ask people to raise their hands if they've ever grown non-BT cotton. Well, there's actually fewer and fewer producers today that ever even grew non-BT cotton. 2017 will be the 22nd year we've planted BT cotton. That's hard to believe, isn't it? So anyhow, but we've come a long ways and now we're spraying two to three times on average and the bulk of those sprays are gonna target stink bugs. But anyway, just a little on the history of BT cotton. And again, I mentioned 1996 was the year that Bowl Guard cotton was introduced in the marketplace. Um, now, since that time, we've had new introductions of BT cotton. And this is just kind of a little historical chart showing how we went from single gene BT cottons to two gene BT cottons and now we're entering a phase where we're having three gene BT cottons. Now the question is, why is industry adding new genes to the BT cottons? There's two reasons. Number one, when we go back to 1996, Tim, Bruce, it wasn't uncommon for us to spray corn earworms. Y'all remember that? When we had 555, maybe we sprayed 25% of the acres. Some years, over half the acres were sprayed for corn earworm. That's because we had this single gene, this CRY1AC. 2003, we brought a second gene on top of the first gene in Bolgard II, and now, you know, efficacy was improved. So by adding these genes, we improved efficacy. The other reason we are adding genes is for resistance management. 2014 was the first year we had a three gene cotton commercialized. That was a phytogen. 2017, you'll hear of Twin Link Plus and Bolgard 3, limited supply, but those are coming to the marketplace. Long-term sustainability, we need these, okay, for resistance management purposes. But one of the things to, <coughs> to point out to you, all these genes, with Twin Link and the Bolgard and Wide Strike, they're they're similar genes, but they are different. The first gene in Twin Link's a little different than the first gene in Wide Strike and Bolgard II, but they perform pretty similar. The second genes, now Wide Strike's a totally different gene.
than the second gene in Bolgard 2. Bolgard 2, the second gene in Bolgard 2 in twin link, again, it's a little different but somewhat similar. But the point I'm making, the third gene is all the same. So there's a lot of similarity in here. The big difference is this second gene in wide strike. But the point is we're adding these genes to help prolong activity, help delay development of resistance. But um, number one, we've come a long ways. Uh, you know, the last several years when we've been planting Bolgard II, you know, we lost 555. Oh, man, we thought that was going to be tough for us in Georgia just because we lost a great variety. But, man, have we come a long ways with varieties. And the insect control with these two and three gene cottons is way superior to when we had a single gene. On my computer in my office, the, the oldest files I could find was from 2005. And this is the actual rating chart that I had put together back in 2005. And I just want to show you how the efficacy of the single gene was improved when we added the second gene. First and foremost, if you look at pests like soybean looper and our army worms, when we had a single gene, we didn't have much activity there. Why did we plant BT cotton? What pest was our number one target? Tobacco budworm. Still today, whether it's a single gene, a two gene, or a three gene, we still have very, very good efficacy on tobacco budworm. So we always need to remember that. That's what we really wanted, and that's what we got. <clears throat> when we added the second gene to the, to the first gene, we improved efficacy on corn earworm. And that was important because we were treating, you know, a, a significant part of the acreage for corn earworms when we had the single gene. And that's something I want you to remember. But the, the second genes really helped us on some other pests. But what I want to focus on today is corn earworm. <clears throat> Number one thing, if you remember nothing else from my talk today, I want you to remember this and take it home with you. BT cottons are not immune to caterpillar pests. I don't care if it's got one gene, two gene, three genes, doesn't matter. I've been in University of Georgia since 1996. That was the year BT cotton was commercialized. Every single year I've been here, I've seen or discussed with some one a problem with corn earworm on BT cotton. It happens. It happens. It's extremely important that that we use good IPM, and we still manage corn earworms because these things are not immune. They are not immune. These three gene BT cottons are going to be great, even better efficacy than what we got, but they're still not immune. Never have been immune. So now, I, I kind of talk about this history a little bit because I want to share some information with you. BT technologies, if we look at performance of BTs as a whole, we're seeing a reduction in efficacy against corn earworm. Okay? What crops do we plant that utilize BT technologies? Corn and cotton. All right, we're cotton guys, right? Have you seen a big change in how bad corn earworms and cotton on your farm? Probably not. If you're a corn guy, have you seen changes in the, how BT corn performs? Probably. Okay, so we're seeing changes, at least in the field, it's happening in corn. Now, when we talk about BT technologies, these genes are similar whether they're in corn or cotton. And a corn earworm, whether it's in corn or cotton, still a corn earworm. Okay? This is just a little data just to illustrate this change in efficacy that we're seeing in field corn. This is some data from David Bunton, a corn entomologist. Goes back from 2009 up until this past year. This is just showing percentage reduction in kernel damage uh, with BT corn, okay? He has two planting dates here. The, green, the blue bar is the early planted corn the red line's late planted corn. Now you're gonna have a lot more pressure on late planted corn. 
But what I want you to look at is what happened in 2015 and 2016. Performance has gone down, right? We're down around 30%, 40% control. Even on the early planted corn, what's that? Less than 50% control, where we'd like to be up here around 80. So something's changed in corn. Do you see it? So we need to be aware of that. Some of you say, well, we hadn't had more issues in cotton as far as bowl damage. But a change has occurred. And Bruce, people that spend a lot of time in cotton, I've seen it, people text me pictures, but we see more square damage in BT cotton than we ever did. We can go back five years, we never saw square damage in BT cotton. Sometimes in wide strike, but never in Bogart too. But we see it in Bogart too now. Not an economic problem, but it just is all these hints that something is changing. <clears throat> now this is some data from Greg Payne. Greg Payne's an entomologist uh, at West Georgia. And the Cotton Commission funds Greg to look at susceptibility of corn earworms from all over Georgia. He looks at susceptibility to pyrethroids and also to spinosa. But one of the things when we talk about how susceptible corn earworm is to BT, there's a lot of variability. Okay, if we just look at all these yellow bars on the far right, that's different populations of corn earworms that Dr. Payne tested for their sensitivity to corn earworm. A lot of variability. This is LC50s. That's the dose it would take to kill 50% of that population but a lot of variability. There's always been a lot of variability, okay? There's always been a lot of variability. But we're starting to see some variable performance in the field, and the point is something's changing. This is some data from the southeast that we sent to a colleague at North Carolina State. <clears throat> Not to get caught up on the numbers, but these represent the, the dose it takes to kill half of the population. Uh, but there were four of the eight populations that appeared to be a lot more difficult or a lot less sensitive to BT than others. But again, there's variability out there. Always has been. Now we have concerns that we're starting to see this reduction in susceptibility. It's not the end of the world. Maybe nothing changes in cotton. But one of the messages I hope to give you today is we need to be prepared to be better managers if we do have issues. If you've never seen problems with corn earworm and BT cotton, this is where you're going to find it. It's typically going to be near the uppermost white bloom in a plant. A node or two below that uppermost bloom Back when we had single gene 555, if, if we saw a lot of that, 25% of the blooms had a little tiny worm, we knew what was fixing to happen, okay? We see them in blooms, under bloom tags, but that's where we're gonna see problems if and when they occur. And the point I just wanna make to you is that something's changing. Uh, we have concerns, we want to encourage you to make sure you're scouting cotton on a frequent basis. I want to make sure you're informed about what's happening in Georgia. As I met with county agents this year, <clears throat> one of the things we talked about was communication. So if you have problems, please communicate with your county agent because if we see problems anywhere in Georgia, we want to get that out to the folks as quick as possible. Hopefully everything's going to be well, but if we, what we suspect is happening, we're losing activity out of that first gene, but it's going to change that rating chart a lot, okay? Particularly for these, these bottom three. That third gene is still extremely active, extremely active. <coughs> Man, I've talked so much this week, I'm about gone. Any questions on that? Part of that maybe with uh, 
Well, again, I'm talking just about BTs here, so. But as far as, you know, actually attaining control with the spray, you still got to have a good application. It don't matter what, what pest we're dealing with. So are you talking, yeah. are you talking about a resistance or are you talking about a, the gene is weaker? Which, no, we're talking about a change in susceptibility. Okay. We're talking about a change in susceptibility. I'm not calling it resistance yet. Right. But, you, yeah. but that first gene that was put in there 20 some years ago. Not having the effects it, that it was. It doesn't appear it is. Okay. So one of the traits seems to be worse than the other right now? As far as the gene or the traits is. Yes. Yeah, let's go back. We may just have to stop after this, but uh, <coughs> so the gene we think we're having problems with is probably this one right here. Okay. So that's where the there's a lot of pressure on this second gene. All right. The second gene is the same for pretty similar for twin link and Bolgard two. But these two are different. All right, if we just look at the technologies as a whole and we've ranked them in terms of efficacy, where is that? Most active on the top, least active on the bottom. Wide strikes the least active is because that second gene is not as active on corn earworm as the second gene in Bogart 2. This third gene that all the companies are putting in is really good. <clears throat> so if we truly lost activity from the first gene, you know, does, does it look like that? Right. Does this one look like that? You know, who knows? But again, uh, the take home point is something's changed and we just need to be, we just yeah. need to keep an eye on it. Right. And one of the things that some of you may have seen me at grower meetings, and you know, I, I just am stating the facts as I see them, we're not scouting cotton as, as good as we should. We're getting by because we've had great, great technology. Okay? I'm going to stop there because our time is up.